This is Creating a Family, talk about foster, adoptive, and kinship care. Welcome back to all you regulars, and a special shout-out, welcome to our newbies. We are so glad to have you. I'm Dawn Davenport. I am the host of this show, as well as the director of the nonprofit, creatingafamily.org. Today, we're going to be talking about what adoptees think about adoption. We're going to be talking with Nicole Davey. She is a dedicated advocate and professional with a passion for enhancing the lives of children and families. She is the director of research at the National Council for Adoption, and she leads research initiatives that inform legislation advocacy and empowers professionals and policymakers. We will also be talking with Ryan Hanlon. Ryan is the National Council for Adoption's president and CEO, and he is passionate about utilizing research and education to ensure that all those impacted by adoption have their resources and the support they need to thrive in their families and communities. Ryan has expertise in accreditation and regulatory issues, state licensing matters, and adoption-related policy topics. It's important to note that while neither of them have lived experience as an adoptive person, the report we're going to be talking about was based exclusively on surveying those who do have lived experience. So this is the second or third of your profiles in adoption, and this one focuses on the adult adoptee experience. As Ryan knows, and Nicole will soon learn, this is just music to my ears. (laughs) I was so happy when I saw this come out. I loved your profiles in adoption report on birth families, and we interviewed you folks based on that one, talking about birth and natural parents. It was absolutely wonderful to see what you have done in the area of adult adoptees. So, Nicole, let me start with you, and we're going to bounce questions between you and Ryan. So, who did you interview for the Profiles in Adoption Adult Adoptee Experience Report, and how did you find them? So, shocker, we interviewed adoptees, uh, (laughs) specifically adult adoptees, who were adopted in the United States, whether that's from another country into the United States, domestically and foster care adoptions in the United States. We did exclude step-parent adoptions from this study. So we ended up with 1,247 eligible respondents after we cleaned the data and removed any responses that did not meet our criteria. So we had 154 from foster care, 617 from private domestic adoption, and 447 from inter-country adoption. We were able to locate these respondents through predominantly email dissemination. We used our listserv. We reached out to member agencies. We had some concerns about the increase of bots when it comes to online responses. So we kept it to direct contact dissemination. That is such an interesting point. I've heard that from other researchers because one of the things that we do at Creating a Family is often help researchers by posting that they're looking for participants. And it's a real issue now that we have to be concerned about. Yeah. It seemed like you were had significantly more international adoptees than you did from foster or domestic infant. Did I hear you correctly on that? And if so, Nicole, why? Yeah, private domestic was the highest count we had, but foster care was significantly lower than the other two. I think Ryan might be able to speak a little bit more on those differences. Do you have a feel for why? I I can imagine a number of reasons why. You know, it, it might be when we did our outreach, we did outreach to agencies that are working in adoption, and we asked them to help disseminate this to adoptees in their network. And they might be more likely to be in contact with adoptees, whereas often someone who was placed for adoption from foster care doesn't have a or maintain a connection with the agency that was involved Mm -hmm. there. So that could be part of the reason. Yeah, I thought that. Don, as you know, the demographics of what type of adoption was doing lots of placements at different periods of time has changed. We did hear from a lot of people that were placed for adoption decades ago when there were far fewer adoptions from foster care. And really, I mean, Mm, since prior to the 1990s, there really were far, far fewer adoptions from foster care than what we're seeing nowadays. Mm -hmm, And, you know, at the same time, prior to, say, the 1970s, there were significantly more private domestic adoptions. Yeah, that makes sense. And so that has fluctuated significantly over time. That could be one of the factors here as well. But we were pleased with a a large sample. It's not perfectly even by those types of adoption. We recognize that. And that did put some limitations in terms of 
what additional analysis we could do. At times we would do analysis by type of adoption. At other times we looked at all the responses together. Nicole mentioned that, you know, the three, you know, large categories that we broke up by type of adoption, some answers were such that they were labeled as other, they, they didn't really fit. So someone who was placed for adoption in the United States a long time ago, but actually lived in an orphanage or a residential setting, we didn't put that in with private domestic adoption because we thought that would be a different experience. We noted that uh -huh. it was put in as other, you know, and you'd have to read the report to see, okay, are we including mm -hmm. those respondents or not? It was a, a small category. It was 29 out of that over 1,200 that were categorized as other. We either didn't have enough information or it was different enough from the other categories that we didn't think it would be appropriate to stick them mm -hmm. in one of those three. I was very thankful when I saw that you were separating by type of adoption and the three types, you have an other, but the three main types were adoptions from foster care, domestic infant adoption, international adoption. We see it happen so often. We run a large online support group, 11,000 some odd members. And when questions come up to be talking about adoption, there seems to be particularly, well, adoptive parents as well as adoptees. It seems like we lump in all of our discussion as to adoption in general. And in fact, there are such significant differences by type of adoption that any discussion, it seems to me, on adoption, we at least have to acknowledge that. So one of the first things I did was flip to see if you did that. And I went, yeah, they did. I was very thankful. Let me also just say to our listeners, this is a highly readable report. It's going to sound very numbers oriented, and it is numbers oriented, but the questions are good. They are questions the way that you might ask them. So this is highly readable, and we will include a link to this report in the show notes so that you can just click on it and get to it immediately. And you're going to want to after you hear this discussion. Don, I think that's a great point. And even within type of adoption, there's a lot of diversity, right? I mean, not just because yes. someone's an inner country adoptee, you know, they might have been adopted from a different country, at a different time period. But even if those things are the same, they could have had very different experiences prior to adoption or yes. in an adoptive family or in some other aspect. And I think that shows throughout. There isn't a monolithic or uniform way that yes. we're able to talk about adoptees or talk about type of adoption here. Very wide ranging responses. And when Nicole and I and our two co-authors set out to actually have this report published, what we wanted was for readers to see exactly what was the question we asked and then what were the adoptees' responses. So we didn't want to do a lot of editorializing there. We wanted to really make this kind of their voices. Heavy. Yes. Yes. And then in the qualitative portion, when Nicole played a lead role in that, she did a lot to just make sure we we were hearing from those voices. She used a lot of quotes directly from the adoptees mm -hmm. to emphasize each of the themes and sub themes. Again, because we wanted this report to be hearing what adoptees views are or their experiences are on the various facets and questions that we put forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you did a good job on that, I felt. So one of the first questions, and it's actually one of the questions I think adoptive parents often in their mind ask, and that is how satisfied, we all hope that we're raising our children to be satisfied, happy, productive adults, and to not live in our basement and not be on our payroll. Um, so all of those are the things that we parents seek. So one of the first questions you asked was trying to get at life satisfaction, which I thought was a good one because that really is what parents are, we don't expect perfection. We don't expect sunshine and roses all the time, but we, we pray that our children are satisfied in life. So Nicole, I'll start with you. And then Ryan, I will come back to you. I know Nicole, you did more of the qualitative responses and less of the number crunching. So how satisfied in general are adopted people? And did you see distinctions when you broke it out by types of adoption? Yeah, so we focus in on a few kind of key categories to assess that satisfaction, right? So we asked about adoption satisfaction specifically. We asked a number of questions to gauge life satisfaction. And then we asked about education, career, and medical status or family satisfaction. And across the board, we relatively found that adoptees were falling within what we were looking at out of a scale of five, they were around 3.3 to four, right? So they're around that like mid-level satisfaction to maybe a little bit within the higher satisfaction range. 
There was a little bit of a range between type of adoption, but not super significant. We also compared based on whether an adoptee had parents of a different race. We were expecting to see a difference in level of satisfaction. And we actually, with life and adoption satisfaction, were surprised to see a slight reduction in satisfaction with families of the same race. So that was a really interesting finding. Yeah. But overall, there is relative satisfaction throughout and for education, career, and then the marital status, family satisfaction, we actually found that over 70% of adoptees were in the somewhat agree or strongly agree for being satisfied on all of those points across all types of adoption, which was really interesting. That is interesting. We were surprised by that finding, as Nicole said. For the life satisfaction question in particular, those five questions that are listed in our report come from what's called the satisfaction with life scale. So it's a standardized instrument that's been used in lots of other research around the world, including, you know, in the U.S. You can compare the results of our report to others who have used it. That's one of the benefits of a standardized instrument. You can compare, you know, different populations. So to directly answer your question, most adoptees have life satisfaction that's going to be in the same range as the general population, if you were to, to look at that. So that was my next question is if you knew what you do no population. Right. That kind of stigmatized view of adoptees as being troubled or being problem children or having behavioral issues throughout their life. There might be reasons why those stereotypes are there, but one of the things we want to do is help dispel the, the myth that all adoptees are very dissatisfied mm -hmm. with their life. Some are. That, mm -hmm. That's true. Some are extremely satisfied. And when we're looking at these populations, especially you know, private domestic and adoption from foster care, we're squarely in, compared to the general population, our average satisfaction levels in our country adoptees slightly more elevated than that. But this is not a tale of two different groups when it comes to life satisfaction. Mm -hmm. It is very safe to assume that the typical adoptee or the average adoptee is going to have life satisfaction the same as the typical person in the United States, the typical member of the general population. You know, it's a, you probably face this as well. We certainly do because we're talking and publishing articles on this on a fairly regular basis. And we do spend a fair amount of time, it feels like, talking about, well, part of our mission is trauma-informed research base, or our two hyphenated buzzwords, trauma-informed. We do spend a lot of time talking about trauma. We talk a lot about setting realistic expectations for adoptive families. We talk a lot about, it feels like, the issues that adoptees might face. And yet, we're sometimes called to task on that because it does feel and, and I, I think it is a valid criticism that we are focusing on air quotes around the word problems. We do it because we want realistic expectations to be set. And we think that that will contribute to better outcomes. On the other hand, it is absolutely true that I... It was about two years ago we started taking a really strong look. Are we being too negative biased? You know, are we? I don't have the answer. I will say that we struggle with it. And we hear from people, adoptees, saying that we are pathologizing them. And I, I hear them. But we also hear from others who say that if we don't focus on the potential issues, we're, you know, having the rainbows and unicorns approach. So I see both sides. <laughs> what can I say? I agree, Don. And I think the more we can look at research and look at what are the variables that might be leading towards some of these outcomes mm -hmm. can be really helpful and to do better education around what some of the outcomes might mean. So for example, Don, you and I had a, a long conversation about the services that adoptees receive, like therapeutic services mm -hmm. post-adoption. And we can look at that and say, well, this is an indication that there's lots of problems or we can look at that and say, this is an indication that a lot of needs are being met. Valid point. So when we label something like receiving therapy as problematic, then we're stigmatizing that experience. And we might be actually preventing someone from getting what needs they have. The flip side of that is if someone's in need of therapy and not receiving it, whatever the challenge that they're facing still persists for them, but they're not going to have that label as having received some type of of therapy. Right. And so yeah. it's really important that we talk about this thoughtfully. Our report looked at how well adoptive parents talked about race, for example. And there's a huge discrepancy between whether or not the parents did that sufficiently. But then also, like when you look at timeframes, how well parents, for example, inner country parents 
talked about birth culture and honoring their their race and ethnicity over time periods. They did it very poorly, you know, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in the 1980s. They did it much better in more recent decades. Let me take a moment to thank the Jockey Bing Family Foundation for their support both of this podcast, but also their support of 12 free courses that we offer on our website. You can find them at bit.ly slash JBF support. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash JBF support. And going back to what Nicole was saying that a bit of a surprising finding was that the general score for life satisfaction, which was over several questions, but the general score for transracial adoptees was slightly higher than for domestic infant and foster care. And I know that you did not tease out the reasons why. I would speculate that one possible reason would be that with transracial families, adoption is front and center as far as you're not going to have late identified adoptees. You're going to have, right. and we're forced to talk about adoption because we're a family obviously formed through adoption. So I don't know. That's one thought, but we don't know why. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. very much a possibility. It could be on the adoptive parents themselves that the type of parent that only would pursue a child who's the same race might have other aspects that are less flexible. I mean, there's there's all sorts of reasons, and you're right, we didn't ask more questions to get at that. I think it's worth exploring in future research and to confirm that other researchers have the same finding that we do, because they very well might not. Yeah, that's interesting. Nicole mentioned it was an area that we were surprised by. Um, it's not an enormous difference in terms of their numbers, but it does prove to be statistically significantly different for our sample. And I think it's worth looking at that in the future to say, you know, what do other researchers find? Or if we do this again, have we been able to repeat that same finding? It's a really good point you raised, though. Is there a difference? That's really interesting. Yes. Is there a difference in the type of parent who adopts transracially from the type of parent who does not? Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Right. And that's not to say that these parents did an amazingly better job. Like Ryan said, the sufficiently addressed issue did not show that a majority of parents did an amazing job addressing race with their children. So well, that's race, though, not necessarily adoption. Yeah, I, yes. I did. I thought that was interesting that a lot of the transracial, the majority of transracial adoptees, I believe, did not think that their parents had done a I think the sufficient was the right. I'm looking at my... That's uh, the word we used. Yeah, Yeah, we asked if they had sufficiently addressed it. You're correct. But that's a different issue from whether they talked about adoption more. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, we're we're all speculating here. One of the questions you ask the adoptees is, did they think that adoption could and did work in their best interest? And then you ask about whether they thought it worked in the best interest of their birth family and did it work in the best interest of their adoptive family, which was very interesting. I liked that split because I was interested to see what they responded. So Ryan, let's start with you. So did adoptees think that adoption worked in their best interest? The responses are provided by type of adoption. And then, as you said, Don, by those three different groups, on the whole, they do. They think it can work in the best interest of all three. And we asked this question very generalized. We didn't ask them, was this true for you? We just said, do you think adoption can work in the best interest of these groups? And then ask them to be responsive the majority for all three types of adoption and for all three populations indicated they do think it can work in the best interest. It's not the same for those three populations. Adoptees are are much more likely to say adoption can work in the best interest of adoptive parents than in birth parents. Mm -hmm. So they're not all equal. There's still a significant minority that says it doesn't work in the best interest of the different parties involved, including adoptees and birth parents. So the answer is We're not uniform by any means, but certainly the majority, at times very large majorities, are saying, yes, this can work in the best interest of all the different parties involved. Ryan, did you see a distinction between the types of adoption and whether they thought that adoption worked in the best interest, let's just say, for the adoptee at this point? The larger differences were actually for inter-country adoption. They tended to be more positive more likely to say they strongly agreed that it can work in the best interest of parties involved, and they were the least likely to strongly disagree that it can work, you know, not work in the best interest of those. So the inter-country adoptees did respond differently than the other two groups. But again, the majorities were saying, yes, this can work in their best interest. 
Don, one of the, the interesting things, we asked the same series of questions to birth parents when they did our prior research mm-hmm. report. And we asked birth parents to answer this by all three populations. Now, as a reminder, or for those that haven't seen that report, we were only looking at private domestic adoption. And the majority of our responses, we, we distinguished between birth mother respondents and birth father respondents. But the same was true there. So our birth mother respondents were by far the largest of those two groups. And they also believe that adoption can work in the best interest of all three parties involved. But similarly, they were more likely to view adoption as working in the best interest of adoptive parents than birth parents. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes. And for those interested, we did uh, Creating a Family podcast on that profiles and adoption birth parent experiences. And you can just search whatever app you're using right now and you can find that. It was a fascinating show as well. Let's move to talking about openness. Now, openness is because you covered and you broke down your responses by year of adoption. And in no area probably, well, transracial is probably another important one to do that, but certainly in openness because we've seen a huge shift in the attitude towards and the emphasis on the importance of open adoption. So, Nicole, what were, in general, the uh, adoptees' thoughts on openness? Yeah, so there were two main factors when we were looking at openness. We were looking at what information adoptees really had access to, and we were also looking at how their families felt about open relationships with birth families. So in regards to accessing information, private domestic and foster care had around 83% of them were reporting like having some birth family information, which was much, much smaller for inner country, which I'm sure mm-hmm. is not that surprising to hear. When it came to family medical history, though, really all types of adoption had a minimal amount and an inner country mostly flagged having no information at all. And then in regards to relationships, being comfortable with a relationship and supportive of a relationship were kind of the two factors we looked at. And we found that adoptive family comfort with and support of was much higher for intercountry adoptions and was around moderate levels for foster care and private domestic adoption. Is there a difference between foster and domestic infant? I think they were relatively similar. I'm just, I'm curious about that because with foster, the excuse, uh, not excuse, it could be the, the real reason, but the, the reason often given is we're concerned about safety. Therefore, we are not interested in having, and, and keeping in mind, openness does not necessarily mean visits and physical contact. It can be just quite frankly, a spirit of openness, although we would hope that there is some form of communication. And I'm just kind of curious, you would think logically that given that reason that you would see less acceptance and more suspicion of openness with foster care. Yeah. So the questions we asked specifically asked about the relationship, whether there was comfort with having a relationship, support of having a relationship, rather than like the wider spirit of openness, which is really important as well. But in regards to the numbers, I mean, Ryan, I'd love to hear your thoughts, but they're relatively similar. I mean, there's like some factors that are slightly different, but I would say overall, the bell curve is pretty similar for the two. Yeah, nothing stands out to me as dramatically different there. And there might be different reasons for that. You know, children placed for adoption from foster care tend to be older. So they might Mm -hmm. have had already an existing relationship that might be easier to maintain, or they might be answering questions around a relationship differently. One of the related questions that we asked just for private domestic adoption, we asked the adoptees when they knew they were adopted, because we know historically it was much more likely that adoptees wouldn't have been told about their status as being adopted, or they were told about it at an older age. So for those looking at a report, it's on page 27. And we looked at it by the decade in which they were placed for adoption. And, you know, to be clear, the majority, a large majority said they knew since they were very young, but they were much more likely in the 50s, 60s, 70s, to say they found out in elementary school or later, over 20% said that in the 1950s, 15 or so percent said that in the 1960s. Later, it drops down and and unfortunately, through our sample remained in that kind of 10 to 12% range where they're finding out in elementary school as opposed to finding out earlier. Hmm. So it's an example of where practices do change over time, but there's still work to be done. No one's saying a good practice would be for someone to find out as a surprise, you know, as opposed to finding out when they're so young that they're continually having conversations so that it's not coming as a surprise to that individual. 
Mm-hmm. And we heard a lot about openness in the qualitative data as well. We had those three key questions that we incorporated in the report. And when we asked adoptees about advice they were giving to adoptive parents, that was a thing we heard time and time and time again. It was our key number one theme that we pointed out about discussing adoption early and often, having a safe space, honesty, you know, no shame and secrecy, because a lot of adoptees experienced, even if their adoption wasn't entirely kept from them, that like mm-hmm. just environment of shame and not telling others about it. And then obviously birth family openness specifically, and really making sure that there was comfort, expectations of openness, mm-hmm. discussions of birth family, all of those things. Mm-hmm. Lack of fear of openness in general. I am loving this interview, so I hate to interrupt it, but I wanted you to know about our Weekend Wisdom podcast where we answer your questions. Since we're answering your questions, we need you to send us your questions. We take about anywhere between five to 10 minutes to answer a question that you submit. So send them to us at info at creatingafamily.org. Going back to the transracial, what were their thoughts. One of the questions, whether transracial adoption should have been allowed. What did you hear from that? I'll start with you, Ryan. Yeah. So just for the audience to know, this question was only asked to adoptees who indicated that they had no parent, no adoptive parent that was the same race as them. So it's a much smaller sample that we heard from here. And the question we asked was, do you believe adoptive, future adoptive parents should be allowed to adopt a child who is a different race slash ethnicity than they are. And for foster care and inner country, they had a very large majority that said, yes, they they should be allowed. They agreed with that statement, a smaller, but I would say, you know, all of these, even when they're a small, you know, minority response or a significant response to be mindful of and to hear from, learn from. For private domestic, it was actually about half and half. Again, mm-hmm. it's a smaller sample, but a slight majority actually disagreed with that statement about future adoptive parents adopting a child of a different race. Again, that for me was a surprising finding me too. and does not match the other two types of adoption that we reported on. It also doesn't match life satisfaction necessarily. Not that they're, those are two separate things and one right. should not get them confused. And I was going to mention that actually in, in a similar vein earlier. I think when we were talking about criticism that I think probably a valid criticism is that creating a family as well as other education-based organizations focus more on the negative. I think it's important for both professionals as well as parents to realize that you can be quite satisfied with your life and still have problems with the institution of adoption. I think that might also play into this question. When I was reading those results, I was also surprised that you could be satisfied with your life and pleased with your adoption, but still not think that, this is back to transracial, not think that transracial adoptions should be encouraged. Although allowed, I think is the word you used. So Yeah, and that, that's correct. And different research studies have actually not had dissimilar findings. Like I'm thinking, for example, of a study that came out of the UK where they looked at private domestic adoptees. They had life satisfaction that was the same as the general population, but they had perhaps lower responses on on other facets of their life. There's a different study that came out of the Netherlands for inter-country adoptees. They actually had higher life satisfaction than the general population, but it didn't necessarily mean when you looked at their education level or their you know, other aspects of their life that they were in some category that would have allowed us to assume that things were better for them. Mm-hmm. So your point on like, what was the question we're asking and then allowing the adoptees to be responsive to that and then not trying to infer more without right. doing the real work to ensure that we have an understanding of that. Yeah, very good point. Because it is tempting, and I will, I am guilty of that when I read some of the, and I go, oh, okay, well, that's because, or which, how do, how do we know? And that's also infantizing of the permanent child where the parent tries to infer reason when we may not have a clue. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the other things when we're talking about how someone might be satisfied with their life, dissatisfied with adoption. One of the other things we found is there's there's a lot of nuance in, in their responses. And this came through in the open-ended questions much clearer because there's obviously more room for the respondents to give us nuance. And they would say things like, my parents could have done better at X, Y, and Z, and I still think they did a good job. 
It wasn't, yeah. a, it was terrible or it was wonderful. They often had something to say where here's what they could have done better. And given the time frame, or given their circumstances or, or they messed this up, like the majority were insufficient at talking about race, but still that same sample is saying, yes, but we still think other adoptees should be allowed to you know, be placed for adoption with parents of a different race. So mm-hmm. this isn't one question tells us everything we need to know. No. And you can't do that in parenting. I mean, I would count it as a win if my kids said, you know, they screwed up, but all in all they did, you know, they did their best or they tried or, or whatever, you know? Oh yeah. It's like baseball, right? If you're batting 500, yeah, you're amazing, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the more kids you have, the more you take that 500. Your lower batting, <laughs> like, your batting yeah, average gets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Ryan, to add on to what you said, something else that's important to mention is that a lot of adoptees flag the fact that they maybe felt that their parents didn't meet a certain need, but that training and education has changed and that that would not be the case if they had been adopted today. So even looking at like, again, we keep talking about this race question, but like, I think many people might say that that's another reason why like adoptive parents should continue to adopt children of maybe a different race or culture, because if they went through today's adoption trainings, that could look very different. And a lot of, a lot of adoptees recognize that fact and said, you know, times have changed, thoughts about this have changed. Like they never would have done it this way, you know, but that's how it was when I was a kid. Along that line, I'm curious, you ask about, which this question surprised me that you asked, but I was really thankful you did. And that is, what were adoptees' thoughts on their family having an annual recognition of adoption? It could be an adoption day, or it could be a family day, but somehow a recognition of their adoption. Nicole, what were their thoughts? Yeah, it was interesting. And to kind of tie to one of the themes that I had throughout the qualitative data was, right, attuning to your specific child's needs, what feels like is working for them. We asked whether or not these adoptees had experienced a celebration of their adoption. And then if they had experienced it, would they recommend it for others? And if they hadn't experienced it, do they wish that that was something their family did? And we pretty much found that those that had it, recommended it and those that didn't, didn't wish that they had. So it it kind of is in line with that. It's not one size fits all and it's finding what works best for your child. And the open-ended responses discussed celebrating the adoption day specifically a lot of the time. It was actually something we highlighted in the contradiction section because we had quotes that were like, this was fabulous. It made me feel special. It contributed to my belonging. And we had other comments that were feeling really othered. Someone compared it to, you know, how dogs have a gotcha day and how insulting that felt to them. So there's really a wide variety in what that experience might be like for an adoptee. Which is in keeping because I, you know, the idea that just because you were adopted puts you in a group that makes you all alike is ridiculous. Yeah. And yet we do that in the literature and in the popular press. It speaks of adoptees as if they're one uniform, fungible group and nothing could be further from the truth. And your qualitative data really, I thought, teased that out well. And Don, for your listeners, there were differences by type of adoption, not by the responses. As Nicole said, those that had it would recommend it for others. Those that didn't wish they had had it on the whole, you know, that was the general response. But even when you ask, did you have an annual recognition? Half of inter-country adoptees families had an annual recognition, but it was only a quarter of those adopted from foster care and just 15% of those who were adopted through private domestic placement. So different experiences by type of adoption as well. Valid point. And I can actually, from a practical standpoint, do see that actually, as I'm sitting here thinking through people who, when we talk about that in our online support group, the Facebook group, by the way, facebook.com slash groups slash creating a family, that would actually play out. The second half of the report is really dedicated more to the qualitative, I think, And you broke the questions out by type of adoption. So, Nicole, if you start with the foster care adoption, one of the questions was what factors they think are important when choosing adoptive parents. And so what factors did they think were important? Yeah, so... That one, we asked a few different types of adoption. And so for foster care, the highest were adoptive parents' age and adoptive parents' race. And for private domestic adoption, it was predominantly adoptive parents' views on openness. 
But those were just our close-ended ones. And then we also had the open-ended for foster care, which was asking for what advice they might have to improving the adoption from foster care process as well. Okay. That's where I want to turn at. Before we do that, factors in choosing adoptive parents. You've mentioned what the number one factor was for foster care, and it was age, number of children already in the home, and adoptive parents' race. For Mm -hmm. Domestic infant, you've said that it was adoptive parents' view on openness. Was there a close second on that one? There wasn't. The next closest was the adoptive parents' political, social, or religious views. And that wasn't very close. It was a, mm-hmm. and they could choose more than one, and, and most did sure. in terms of what are important factors. But it was nearly two thirds who said the adoptive parents' views on openness are what's important. Fascinating. And I was saying, what did international adoptees respond on this, on the factors for choosing adoptive parents? We actually didn't ask that question for intercountry adoption. And the reason we didn't is the way that families are matched via intercountry is often very different. And so we didn't think that that would be a as useful of a response. It still might be interesting to compare adoptees' views on what's important. But for intercountry adoption, as you know, Don, it's often a foreign country who's making a match. And they're not necessarily looking at it by those same factors. And so we wanted a report that could be really practical for professionals and others to really utilize in training future families, in working with the population of adoptees. And we didn't know that that question before in our country would actually be practical for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the country itself has specific criteria for age, health, the whole thing. So it's, yeah. All right. So now from the qualitative responses, you specifically, let's start with foster care. I believe that your questions were advice for improving the foster care adoption. And you've got, of course, a number, quite a few responses. But Nicole, could you briefly summarize or highlight a couple of responses? Definitely. So like we said, we only asked this question to foster care adoptees. So it was a smaller response rate by far than our other two questions that we highlighted. We had 125 responses that we were analyzing, but there were definitely some key themes that pulled through. Many discussed placement and permanency decisions, specifically the importance of prioritizing family preservation and reunification. That was probably our most recurrent response. A lot about caregiver screening and training and the importance of having even more comprehensive evaluations on specifically the motivations and parenting capabilities of adoptive parents. There was also discussion of having more time for reviewing suitability post-placement, but pre-adoption and kind of seeing how the family is adapting to having the child in the home, how the child is feeling about their placement, and a lot of discussion about needing even more increased training for on trauma issues, on birth family openness, really making sure that visitation is encouraged and happening, and more training on cultural competency and transracial adoption. There was a lot of discussion on accessing supports and services, as well as more key information. So therapy and mental health was discussed a lot. Services for both the child and the adoptive parents was discussed a lot, as well as the importance of ensuring that adoptees from foster care are being able to access comprehensive medical history, birth family information, and birth certificates came up again and again. And there was a subset of adoptees that really focus more on discussing what they felt was the brokenness of the foster care system that we wanted to make sure we also included. There were some calls for entirely overhauling the foster care adoption system and even some that referenced the importance of abolishing it altogether. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hear of those as well. We hear that view. Moving to some of the open-ended views on inter-country placements. One thing that surprised me Well, first of all, one of the questions before I get to mine that surprised me was, are they in favor of intercountry adoption? And the way you ask it was when family reunification and domestic adoption are not possible in the child's birth country, do you believe the U.S. should continue to allow intercountry adoption? And the overwhelming majority said yes. One that surprised me was, I I guess somehow I thought that more had traveled to their birth country. You ask, had they traveled back to their birth country? And only 41% had said yes. I don't know why that surprised me, but it did. You know, I didn't know what to predict. So for me, I was interested in the results. And one of the things I, I guess I've seen anecdotally is that it often is country specific. It seems that there are certain countries 
Adoptees are more likely to travel back to than others. There might be like geopolitical reasons for that. It might also end up being a cultural thing that they're connected with either their agency who's organizing this or other adoptees who have helped, you know, make connections for them. What's interesting though, is the vast majority of those who have done a trip like that recommend it to other adoptees. And so it seems to be, you know, we don't want to read too much into this without, you know, hearing from them directly, but we said, based on your experience, would you recommend a birth country trip to other inter-country adoptees? And we only asked that to those who had done one. And it was 90% said yes, 1% said no. And there was a you know 10% or so that had a more nuanced view. They could say other, and then they, they listed that out. But overwhelmingly, they're viewing this as something that they would recommend to other adoptees. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was caveats, you know, yes, if it was adoptee led or yes. Exactly. Yeah. But type of thing. Did you know that in addition to this podcast and a website full of resources for you, that's creatingafamily.org, by the way, we also have an online support group. That support group can be found at facebook.com slash groups slash creating a family. So please check it out. All right, so now let's talk about the advice for future adoptive parents. Of course, we were happy you asked that question (laughs) because as parents, we always want to ask the real experts, the adults who are living our child's experience, what they would recommend. And it's going to be impossible to summarize everything, but we'll start with you, Ryan. You broke it into themes. Name a theme that was interesting to you, and then we'll move to Nicole to let her talk about another thing. Sure. Well, Nicole already mentioned openness, and that was by far the biggest thing that that came out for us. The one after that was being child-centered. So following the child's lead, you know, being attentive and attuned to your child, that came through as a, a strong theme. And then I'll let Nicole talk more about some of the contrasting views. But an additional theme was seeking out education, resources, and support for those parents, like really encouraging them to find avenues for that. And then Nicole, I know there was a number of things that came out with the contrasting views and and you spent a lot of time really working through that. Yes, definitely. It took a while to even get it into three themes. Honestly, we had a great diversity in responses. And I think that this is a great opportunity to mention Ryan and I included this in the report, but one of the limitations of this report was our sampling style, which was purposive sampling. And We expect that it skewed the responses in a way that we may have received people who very positively and negatively connect with adoption. Let me stop you a second. I didn't catch what you said. It was some type of sampling. And can you say that word again? Yes. Sorry. So it was non-probability sampling. There was aspects to which it was both purposive, which is what Nicole said, and it would have been having what's called snowball sampling. Non-probability sampling just means we didn't do random sampling to get our final group of respondents. There's reasons for that. It's enormously difficult to do that and get a large sample unless you have the resources of something like the Census Bureau, where you can start you know, with a huge group and then determine who are the adoptees and who are not, and then only randomly select within that group of adoptees. That would allow us to then infer to a larger population of adoptees, if we had done that type of sampling, because we did non-probability sampling, what we wanted to do is we wanted a very large sample. And we want to just be clear that we think there's a lot we can learn from these responses, but we need to be cautious on our generalizing this to all adoptees. Yes. As Nicole said, this can lead to something like selection bias, where I wondered about those that. that really want to have their their views heard because they think adoption is the best thing or those that are really you know opposed to adoption they might be more inclined to respond to a request to complete a survey than someone who has much more neutral views towards adoption i was going to talk to you about that that's, a, that's something that and i think the internet exacerbates that and so it's a challenge and it's a challenge both ways. That's right. And if you just ask adoption agencies, they're going to be more likely to be in contact with people who are more positive because those who have a strong negative view might have then cut off contact with the adoption agency. So, yeah. Right. 
I'm sorry I interrupted you, Nicole, but no, I didn't no, catch no. what you said. And yeah, or just those who are more like engaged with their adoptee identity. Like there's plenty of adoptees who don't think about that facet of their identity at that level. Exactly. They're not engaged in the community. And those are going to be the hardest ones to reach. But that mm-hmm. is going to, in many ways, make it not as representative as we would like it to be. And so we saw that even more so, obviously, in these open ended responses, where it was really shocking and interesting to see how the range of advice. And you have some people who are saying adoption is horrible. You should never adopt. That's the only advice I would give. And people who are saying adoption is the most perfect thing. No one can ever do wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the purpose of this question is really to provide what so many adoptees probably offer in their daily life when someone comes up and says, well, what do you think? And you hear that advice and you think to yourself, okay, this is an important person to like take this advice and really listen to it because they have the lived experience. But wow, can that advice vary, right? Mm -hmm. And seeing this at a grand scale where we were able to identify so many different responses made this really, really helpful. But also it really clarified that the experiences are going to be so different and you really have to take each voice and recognize how much that might vary. So we mentioned communication. Ryan also mentioned being child-centered. That pulls us back to what we discussed before about like really at the end of the day, it's about being attuned to your individual child's needs. Like the variance of responses from really they should have pushed me so much more to be involved with my culture or I was overly pushed and I should have just been able to like be who I was, right? (laughs) But what we heard across the board, no matter what exactly plan or structure adoptees felt was best, it was be a loving parent, be a supportive parent, be patient, be committed, be attentive. Those words came up again and again and again. And being attuned, adjusting to the child's needs, it was really give me the opportunities to engage in the adoptee community, to engage in my cultural or ethnic community, but then let me engage at my own pace and kind of like Mm -hmm. trust that I'm going to be able to communicate that. And we also talk about like a safe space, bringing things up again and again. So it's not just relying on what your child tells you, but there was a lot of really specific factors that we found really helpful. And I tried to include that throughout. And we, like Ryan said, included a lot of quotes because almost none of the words used in this report were our own words. We really tried to pull just exactly what they're saying. What are we seeing the most of? And give that to everyone to do with what they feel is best. Ryan, can you summarize what adoptees wish their parents had done differently, which was a separate open-ended question that you asked? Yes, um, it was a separate question. The kind of three high-level themes aren't that different, actually, than our first question. The first one focused on communication and messaging. It was the same idea of being honest, having that space to communicate, and then to actually be talking about issues as opposed to bearing them or waiting on the adoptee to raise the issue with the parents. The next theme was accessing support. Similar to the prior question, find ways to get the supports that you need as a parent and find those for the adoptee as well. And then the third one, and this one surprised us, adoptees went out of their way to answer this question by saying, my parents did well. So, you know, the the actual question we asked was, what, if anything, do you wish your adoptive parents had done differently related to discussing your adoption with you? And they wanted to tell us that their parents did a good job. We were surprised by that simply because it didn't really directly answer our question. But over and over, that was one of the primary responses we got. And so we ended up including that as the final theme in that section. Mm -hmm. The communication piece was the one that we heard the most. And the driving factor there is sharing information with the adoptee and not having that be something where they've got to, you know, do an end run around the parents or, you know, that kind of lack of information is a void that they're then filling with unknowns or, you know, Mm -hmm. that they don't have the freedom to have that conversation with their parents. Well, once again, thank you so much for the National Council for Adoption for doing these profiles in adoption. I highly recommend this as good reading material for adoptive parents as well as adoptive professionals. Again, we're linking to Profiles in Adoption, Adult Adoptee Experiences in the show notes. It will link you directly to the NCFA site and the PDF that has the report. Thank you so much, Nicole Davey and Ryan Hanlon. Truly appreciate it. We appreciate it too. Thank Thank you. Thank you.